Hi, everyone. I have chosen to take the path less taken. How little has it been taken? Well, when I think of it, I think of this place. And the number 12 comes to mind. That's the number of people that have ever been there. Now, if we think that there have been about 108 billion people ever, those 12 people would represent 0. 0.000000000, 000 000 000, that's 701% of all people. But I can do you one better. Can I? Oh. <laughs> Next, I think of this place, Mars. And the number for Mars is zero. Think about that, zero. And granted, there are some pretty good reasons why we haven't made that journey. And to help put it in perspective, I brought with me my lucky penny. Uh, you probably all have a lot of these kicking around now. <laughs> and right now, I want you to imagine that this penny is the Earth. Everything that you have ever known, your family, art, history, science, technology, everything has existed on the crust of this penny. Now, if this penny was the Earth, the moon would be about the size of the queen's face, a little bit less. Astronomers, please don't take it out on me. I'm an engineer. <laughs> the sun would be about 7.5, somewhere around over here, Yao Meng's height. Mars would be about half the size of the penny. That's the solar system that we're talking about. And to put in perspective the distances, if we were to put all of us in a building, the sun being on the first floor, we would have the Earth on the 105th floor, and Mars would be another 55 floors above that, 160. And taking someone to Mars would be like sending a single bacteria from the crust of this penny all the way up to the 50, another 55 floors up. And it's challenging, but it can be done. And I believe that in 2027, I will be helping land the first human on Mars. Now, the reason why I said helping has to do with that President Kennedy story, where he asked the custodian, what are you doing? He said, I'm helping land the first man on the moon. But the interesting thing is that everyone there believed the same thing. Everyone, all the way up to Mike Collins, Buzz Aldrin, and Neil Armstrong, all believed in the exact same thing. And when they succeeded, we all rejoiced together. It wasn't their success, it was our success. Because they had tried the way and because of it, we knew with certainty that for the first time, we could not just look to the stars, but we could also reach out and touch them. But that's a nice story, really. Let's be practical. Why go to space, right? There's almost nothing there. It's dangerous. And the reason you should go to space is the reason why you should go anywhere, really. You go somewhere because you can get something there that you can't get anywhere else. And space has something that we're very interested in, that we can't get here, and that's space rocks. Now, <laughs> I will admit, that's my dream job right there. That's what I'm working for, too. And in fact, rocks are so important that at the end of the Apollo program, one of the last astronauts to go to the moon was in fact a geologist named Harrison Schmidt. Now, because this is what I wanted to do, the first thing that I decided to do was I wanted to go study geology. So I went out and I started learning about rocks. I learned that rocks can tell us stories if we know how to listen to them. This rock in particular tells us a story of how old our planet is. As you can tell, it's really tiny. It's a little bit thicker than a human hair. But it tells us that our planet is about at least 4.4 billion years old. So now you guys know how we know those things. And so, in my pursuit of ge geology, I also got a chance to do some field exploration. I traveled all over Canada, I went to go visit some places, some of which probably have never been visited by humans. I later found out that it was because the bears got there first, <laughs> and bears don't like visitors. Yogi is not friendly. <laughs> and after this period of geology and studying, I decided that I wanted to do more to get involved. And that's what brought me to York. So I came to York to study at the Lausanne School of Engineering, decided to do space engineering, or as we affectionately call it, 
astronaut school. Now, when it comes to studying things in space, you have three options. If you want to get a rock, you can wait for it to come to you, which has advantages and disadvantages. <laughs> you can send someone to get it, and uh, if they go, hopefully they come back. We don't want to leave them there. Uh, and if that's not an option, you can send something to just go study it there for you. Now, having spent some time in the field, I was uh, in some bear encounters. I was kind of biased towards this option here. If I don't have to go, I'd like to be home, so this is comfortable. So one of the things that I did at York is York has a really great, uh, unique team called the York University Rover Team. Um, and at the Rover Team, I got a chance to work with, I will admit, some of the most passionate, talented, hardworking students I have ever met. And in the Rover Team, we started working on a project called Ares. And Ares was a Mars rover prototype that was meant to work one day alongside a human explorer on Mars. But we didn't just build it. We went out and tested it. We traveled all over the United States. We went over to the Mars Rover Society. We went to the Kennedy Space Center and competed in Lunabotics. All along the way, competing with other student groups from around the world in different universities in different capacities who all believe in the same idea. And also during that time, I got a chance to meet some really exceptional people. I got a chance to travel around and meet people like Buzz Aldrin, Robert Zubrin, a bunch of JPL scientists, engineers, and even some space lawyers. There are space lawyers. <laughs> Unfortunately, they have not stayed there. Um, but I've also come across hundreds more of really committed individuals who all believe this in the idea of advancing exploration of space for all of us including this guy right here. Uh, his name is Elon Musk. I'm sure some of you might recognize, and I'm sure a lot of you will recognize him more in the future. The important thing about Elon is he's got billions of dollars, rockets, and wants to put someone on Mars in the next 15 years. So he's my best friend right now. <laughs> so after I did all this, I came back to York, and I decided, OK, I need to take it up a notch even more. I wanted to do more to get involved. And because this is York, I didn't have to go very far. I got a chance to join the Planetary Exploration Lab here, working with Professor Michael Daly, who's worked on the Canadian LiDAR mission, so he's actually sent stuff to Mars, and the upcoming OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter. So the expertise for world class was right here at York, so I lucked out again. And what do I do in this incredibly exciting place? Well, I study rocks. <laughs> so this rock in particular is called 25143 Irokawa. Don't worry, you won't be quizzed. And Irokawa was visited by a Japanese robot, Hayabusa, and actually brought back a sample. So we have a little piece of this. But the exciting thing about Irokawa is that Irokawa is opening up the window to the future for human exploration, for exploration of space in general. And to give you an idea of how weird Irokawa is, if I were to get my penny and drop it here, in a fraction of a second it hits the ground. The gravity in Irokawa is so little, it would take almost two and a half minutes for it to hit the ground. Also, it has no atmosphere, is as cold as Antarctica in winter, has a 12-hour day. And if I were to just hop up, I would never hit the ground again. So it's a really interesting place, and that's why I'm interested in it. But Irokawa is also opening up other doors. Because by analyzing, exploring, and understanding this rock, we are beginning to open the doors for our exploration in space, which means that we are, for the first time, going to be breaking the closed-loop system on Earth. Everything here that we've ever had has come from the Earth. For the first time, we're going to get our resources from out there. And so I want you to now challenge another idea about space exploration. So let's dream with me for a second. Imagine the first lunar settlers a long time in the future. What will they be doing? Well, our sense of identity comes from where we're born. So the first lunar settlers, this is not just a scientific question. How would they identify themselves? Would they be lunar first nations? Just think about how your identity will be shaped when you relate to this little blue dot in the sky. Now, T.S. Eliot said, we shall not cease from exploration. And at the end of all of our exploring, we'll be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And I assure you, we are exploring. People all over the world are working towards this goal. And in the coming years, we will be getting closer and closer. But I am here today because I believe that this is not just my time. 
This is our time. And that this may sound like dreams, but in the words of John Lennon, some say I am a dreamer, but I am not the only one. So I hope someday you'll join us, because in 2027, we are helping land the first human on Mars. And that is just the beginning of another journey. Thank you.